Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This meeting of the Totog Management Board is called to order. My name is Bill Hyatt. I'm the governor's appointee from Connecticut and the current chair of this board. Um, in fact, this is my last meeting as chair, which is really strange because we, we haven't done a single in-person meeting during my tenure as chair. So very strange times indeed. Um, first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Does uh, anyone have any modifications? Tony, any hands? I see no hands, Bill. Okay, seeing none, the agenda is approved. Next is approval of the proceedings from the August meeting. Uh, does anyone have any edits? Any I hands, Tony? I see no hands, Bill. Okay, so the proceedings are approved. Uh, next on the uh, on the list is public comment. Tony, is there anyone signed up or do we have any hands? Technically, we don't have a sign up, so I would just be looking for hands and I do not see any hands at this time. Okay, so having none, we'll move right along to item four on the agenda and that's review of the 2021 stock assessment update. And uh, Coley, I think you have a presentation. I do. I um, it looks like it's up on the screen now. Um, so uh, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to do this uh, stock assessment update presentation for you. Um, Coley, I'm with uh, the Todd Technical Committee Chair. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, to start, I just wanted to make sure you could recognize everyone who worked on the Todd Stock Assessment Subcommittee uh, for this update. It's myself, Linda Berry. Jacob Casper, Alexi Shirov, Sam Truesdale, Katie Drew, and Kirby Roots Murdy. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, so to start, I'm going to review the data um, that went into the update this year, including the new MRIP estimates. Um, as you all know, there was a recalibration done recently um, to the MRIP program, um, which resulted in some pretty drastic changes across all species. Also going to review the estimates of uh, F and SSB and how those new MREP numbers impacted both of those metrics and do uh, a review of the stock status and some short-term projections that were done um, as a result of that status. Can do the next slide, please. Uh, so as a quick little reminder, TOTOG is managed in four separate regions. Um, those regions are seen here. In blue, you can see the Mari region, which is Massachusetts and Rhode Island. In green, we have the Long Island Sound region, which is Connecticut. And most of New York, that is New York and the northern part of Long Island Sound. Um, in orange, you can see the New Jersey, New York Bight region, which is the southern portion of Long Island Sound and New Jersey. And then in red, you can see the Delmarva region, which is Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. And so because we have this in four separate regions, I have four um, little updates to show you um, for the entire uh, coast of this species. Uh, next slide, please. And so the previous assessment was um, had data through the terminal year of 2015 where this update for 2021 does have data through 2020. So we are adding five years of data for this assessment. With adding all this data, we did see a few challenges. Uh, the first one I mentioned earlier was those new um, MRIP numbers for all the regions, which did include data for the entire time series, that is 1981 to 2020. Um, so that was the first big thing we had to look at. The second thing, as you know, not unexpected was the impacts of COVID-19. Um, because of COVID-19, not all of the fisheries independent surveys were able to be completed in 2020, leaving some data gaps there. In addition to those fisheries independent surveys not being completed, uh, MREP did have some uh, limited sampling in 2020. As a result, some of the 2020 removals were estimated with imputed data from prior years to just to account for that inability of sampling during that time. Uh, next slide, please. So to start here, we have the new MREP numbers. Um, as you can see, we have the 
four separate regions here. In the top left, you can see the Mare region. The top right, you can see the New Jersey, New York Bight region. In the bottom left, you can see the Long Island Sound region. And in the bottom right, we have the Delmarva region. In that gray line, you can see the original estimates. And then in the black line, you can see the calibrated uh, new numbers from MRIP. As you can see across all four regions, we did have increases in the total removal estimates. And these removals are the um, landings plus two and a half percent mortality rate on the live releases in millions of fish. And again, you can see that we did see increases across all four regions in terms of total removals. Uh, next slide, please. And so here you can see um, a similar plot in terms of where the regions are situated, but instead of being the removals in millions of fish on the y-axis, you can actually, this shows you the percent difference as in the increase in removals across those four regions during all of the time series. Um, all the regions did have very, very large increases due to the new um, recalibration. And these increases averaged between 133% increase to 163% increase across those four regions. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have the total removals for the four regions. Again, Mari is in that top upper left, New Jersey, New York bite in the upper right, Long Island Sound in the bottom left, and Delmarva in the bottom right. And so here we have the total removals in metric tons. The light blue color is the recreational removals. The dark blue is the recreational release mortalities. And again, that is that two per, two and a half percent um, mortality rate on those recreational harvests. And the white is the commercial harvest. Overall, Tachagi is a highly um, recreational fishery, upwards of 90% 90, 90 recreational removals, as you can see in these figures here. And overall, you can see similar patterns for all four regions, and that is that we have high removals in the beginning of the time series with a decline over, over time. Um, and again, the important thing to note here as well is that those recreational removals do make a large, um, are a large part of the total harvest. Um, and so those new recalibrated MRIP numbers did have a large impact on the total removals for each region. Next slide, please. And so, I'm gonna go through now the indices that were used within re each region in this stock assessment update. Here we have the Mari regions indices. There are four uh, indices for this region. At the upper left, you can see the Massachusetts Trawl Survey. This is an age one plus survey. Um, and as you can see here, we had some high values up in the beginning of the time series with a slow de with a decline overall. In the upper right, you can see the Rhode Island Trawl Survey. This is a fall trawl survey targeting age one plus individuals. And you can see a similar trend here where we had high values in the beginning of the time series with a decline um, over the time. In the bottom left, you can see the Rhode Island SANE Survey. This is a young of the year SANE survey that targets Narragansett Bay. And you can see a little bit more um, variability within the index over time here. And in the bottom right, you can see the MREP CPU index, which is an age one plus survey. Again, you can see some of those higher in, uh, values in the beginning of the time series with a little bit of a decline over time. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have the indices used for the Long Island Sound portion of the assessment. In the upper left, you can see the Connecticut Long Island Sound Trawl Survey. This is an age one plus survey. Um, again, you can see some of those higher values in the beginning of the time series with a little bit of a decline over time. It's also too important to note that this is one of those um, surveys where we have a data gap in as the survey was not 
able to be conducted in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the upper right, you can see the MRIP CPUE survey, which is an age one plus survey for the region. And the bottom left, you can see the New York Conic Bay Trawl Survey. This is an age one survey. And in the bottom right, you can see the New York Western Long Island SANE survey, which is a young of year survey. Um, there were some modifications to the sampling of the New York um, Long Island SANE survey, and that is just to account for the fact that New York does border those two different regions, the Long Island Sound region and the New York, New Jersey bite region. Next slide, please. Here we have the indices of abundance for the New Jersey, New York bite region. In the upper left, you can see the Western Long Island SANE survey. Again, this is that age one survey with some modifications to account for the differences between the two regions that New York does um, border the Long Island Sound and the New Jersey, New York bite region. In the upper right, you can see the New Jersey Ocean Trail Survey. This is a age one plus survey and was not conducted in 2020 due to the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, therefore, we do have a small data gap there. And in the bottom left, you can see the MREP CPUE survey, which is an age one plus survey. Okay, next slide, please. And here we have the indice or the index for the Delmarva region, which is just the MREP CPUE survey. Um, in this region, we do not have any fisheries independent surveys, so we just have the MREP CPUE for this. Um, particular portion of the stock assessment. Next slide, please. So the first step that the stock assessment subcommittee took was to see what the impacts of the new MRIP numbers would be on the stock assessment before we added more years of data. This gave us the ability to just see how the new MRIP numbers would impact the stock assessment before um, looking at the additional years of data. And so because of this, we ran a bridge model. So we took the 2016 update, which was the most recent assessment before this one, that included data through the terminal year of 2015. We then put in the new MRIP numbers um, in place of the older uncalibrated numbers and re-ran the model. This gave us the ability to see how those numbers impacted the previous assessment before we added the five new years of data in the 2021 um, update, which is you know, what we are looking at today. Next slide, please. So here we have the uh, results of the three models in 2000, the 2016 update in the orange the 2016 bridge model, that is the 2016 model with the new MRIP numbers. And in black, we have the 2021 update. And so we have the four regions here, Mari on the upper left, New Jersey, New York bite in the upper right, Long Island Sound in the bottom left, and Delmarva in the bottom right. And as you can see, um, here we have F on the Y axis and the time series along the X axis. The new MREP numbers had very little impact on the differences in F. Um, there were some changes over time, but there wasn't any um, consistent you know, um, overestimation or underestimation in any of the four regions. Next slide, please. Here we have um, the same layout for the spawning stock biomass. As you can see here, the 2016 update again in that orange um, is lower across all four regions than the bridge model in blue or the 2021 update in black. So we did see an increase in the estimation of the spawning stock biomass across all four regions. This does 
this is expected as we did see an increase in harvest. Therefore, we would anticipate seeing an increase in the um, fish available within each region. Generally, adding the additional years of data didn't have a very large impact on the results. Although you can see in the Long Island Sound region, we did see um, in the bridge model an estimated little bit of a decline from 2010 to 2015. However, when we added those additional five years of data, we do see that um, population starting to bounce back upwards. Next slide, please. And here we have the results of the model for recruitment with recruitment on the y-axis again. And as you can see across all the regions, we did see a little bit of a scaling upwards in recruitment. That is, you can see that 2016 update in orange and then the 2016 bridge model and the 2020, uh, 2021 update in black. You can see that's uh, recruitment scaling upward in all four regions. Again, this is somewhat anticipated given that we did see more removals, therefore there must have been more fish to support those additional removals for each region. We also did see some changes um, from year to year in each region, but again, there was no consistent over or under estimation of recruitment in any individual region. Next slide, please. So now I'll go into the stock status from each for each region based on the assessment update. To start, we have the Mari region where we are not over fish. The SSB was estimated to be 6,568 metric tons in 2020 with a, with a threshold of 4,335 metric tons. So this region is not overfished as we are above the threshold and the target. In the bottom there, you can see the F estimates. And you can see that overfishing is not occurring in this region. The three-year average of F is estimated to be 0.23 which is below the threshold of 0.49. It is also below the target for this region. Next slide, please. Here we can see we added a blue vertical line to indicate what the status was in 2015, which was the time of the last assessment. And so for the Mari region in the top uh, image here, you can see that that blue line intersects the dark black line at the um, SSB, and we were below the target, that we were above the threshold and below the target in 2015, indicating that we were not overfished. In 2020, we've continued to be not overfished in this region as we do have that SSB above the threshold as well as the target indicating that there, there has not been a change in um, status for this region. In the lower image here, you can see that blue line um, intersecting the F estimate below the threshold in 2015, indicating that overfishing was not occurring during that time period. In 2020, we continue to see that, that the F is below the target and the threshold, indicating that overfishing continues to not be occurring in 2020, indicating that there has been no change for the region as well. We continue to be overfishing is not occurring. Next slide. Here we have the results of the Long Island Sound region. Long Island Sound currently is not overfished as indicated in the top figure. SSB was estimated to be 6,413 metric tons with a threshold of 5,044 metric tons. So as you can see here, we are above the threshold and we're right on pretty close to the SSB target. So we are currently not overfished. In the bottom figure, you can look at, uh, you can see F 
the three-year average of F is estimated to be 0.3, which is below our threshold of 0.38, indicating that overfishing is currently not occurring in the Long Island Sound region. Next slide, please. Here, once again, we've added that vertical blue line to indicate where we stood in 2015 as a comparison. And in 2015, in the top figure, you can see that um, SSB was below the uh, threshold in 2015, indicating that in 2015, the stock was overfished in the Long Island Sound region. Since then, we have, actually, we have seen an increase in SSB and actually in a change in status where in 2020, we are no longer overfished in the Long Island Sound region. In the bottom figure, you can see in 2015 where that blue line intersects that we were overfishing. Since 2015, there has been a decline in F in the Long Island Sound region. And currently overfishing is not occurring in the region, indicating an improved stock status for Long Island Sound. Next slide, please. Here we have the stock status for the New Jersey, New York bite region. Currently the region is overfished with an SSB estimated to be 4,782 metric tons with our threshold of 4,890 metric tons. So while we still are overfished, it is, I would just like to, um, draw attention to the fact that we do see that SSB um, improving over time, and we are seeing an uptick in that trend for SSB for the New Jersey, New York bite region. In the bottom figure, you can see the F, and we can see that overfishing is currently not occurring in the New Jersey, New York bite region. The three-year average F is estimated to be 0.26 with our threshold of 0.3. So we are below that threshold. So overfishing is not occurring in this region. Next slide, please. And here we have that um, comparison between the 2015 status and the status from 2020. So in the New Jersey, New York bite region, you can see that in 2015, where that um, vertical blue line interest, intersects the SSB estimate that we were overfished. Again, in 2020, we are still currently overfished, but we are seeing that upward trend in SSB. Um, so while there is no change in the stock status, we are seeing that trending upwards closer to being a not no longer overfished stock. In the bottom figure, you can see the change in status um, for F. In 2015, we were overfishing, indicated by that intersection uh, between the vertical blue line and the SSB, or the F tar, tar sorry, between F, the blue line showing where 2015 exists and the F status. Um, we were above the threshold in that, period, so we were overfishing. However, we have seen a decline in F since then, and now we can see that we overfishing is not occurring in this region, and therefore we do see an improved stock status there. Next slide, please. And for the last region, we have the Delmarva region, and we are currently not overfished in this region. SSV is estimated to be 4,396 metric tons with the threshold of 3,355 metric tons. Additionally, in the lower figure, you can see that overfishing is not occurring in this region. The three-year F average is 0 0.06, which is below the threshold of 0.27. Next slide, please. And in comparison to 2015, in 2015, the Delmarva region once was considered overfished, as you can see here, where that blue line is intersecting with the annual SSP in the top figure. Since then, we've seen an increase in SSP to the point where in 2020, we are 
you see this region is not overfished. So there has been an improvement in the stock status there. In the lower figure, you can see in 2015, overfishing was not occurring within this region. So you can see that blue line is intersecting with the three-year average F below the threshold. In 2020, we continue to see that overfishing is not occurring, so there has not been a change in stock status in terms of uh, F for this region. Next slide, please. So uh, just as a little bit of a summary here, um, I do recognize that with four regions, there was you know, a whole lot going on. Um, for the SSB status in the Mari region, we are currently not overfished, and there has been no change in that status from 2015, where we were also additionally not overfished then. In the Long Island Sound region, we are currently not overfished, which has been an improvement from the 2015 stock status where we were overfished. In the New Jersey, New York bite region, we are currently overfished, which has not changed from 2015. Although it is uh, worthwhile to note that we have seen an improvement in the SSB since 2015. In the Delmarva region, we are currently not overfished, and this has improved since the 2015 stock status where we were overfished. In terms of F, in the Mari region, uh, we are there is no overfishing, and that has not changed since 2015 where we were not overfishing as well. In the Long Island Sound region, we are currently not overfishing, and that has improved since 2015. In the New Jersey, New York bite region, we are not over, there is no overfishing, and that again has improved since 2015. And in the Del Marva region, we are current, there is currently no overfishing, and again, that has improved since 2015. Next slide, please. In addition to the assessment update, the um, subcommittee also conducted some short-term projections for each region. And for these projections, we used the most recent three years of removals, which was 2018 to 2020. The projections um, we did showed the probability that the stock would be overfished, that is the SSB would be less than the threshold and the probability that F would be above the target in 2025. Next slide, please. And so for the projections, you, um, they're here for you guys. Um, so we have each region, the probability of being at or below the F target in three years. In the Mari region, there was 100% chance of, or 100% probability of being at or below the F target. The Long Island Sound region had a 3% chance probability of being at or below the F target. New Jersey, New York bite had a 15% probability of being at or below the F target. And the Delmarva region had a 100% probability of being at or below the F target in three years. We also uh, did the projections for the probability of being at or above SSB threshold in three years, where the Mari region had a 100% probability of being at or above the threshold in three years. The Long Island Sound region had a 97% probability of being above the threshold. The New Jersey, New York bite region had a 53% probability of being at or above the threshold. And the Delmarva region had a 100% probability of being at or above the threshold in three years. So generally, there was a low probability of being overfish under the current landings and management scenarios for each region, but some regions did have a higher probability of being above the F target in that three-year window. Uh, next slide. And uh, so that is the um, quick overview of the stock assessment update. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Carly. That was an excellent presentation and it contained quite a bit of good news. So at, at this point, uh, are there any questions for Coley? And keep in mind that the next item on the agenda will 
include a discussion of management um, management response. So at this point, just please limit yourself to uh, technical questions regarding the stock assessment. Um, any hands? I have Jason McMe, um, Adam Nowalski, Justin Davis, and Jeff Bruss. Okay, go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Coley, awesome job with the presentation. Uh, it's no small feat getting through not one stock assessment, but four simultaneously. So uh, nice job with that. Um, there's one thing, so I'll just sort of echo what the uh, chair said. I wish um, all news on fisheries could be like this. This is pretty amazing. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it um, during my time. Uh, so that's great. Um, one thing that caught my eye was on the, the series of slides you had on the bridge models. Specifically, I was wondering about the Long Island Sound SSB um, plot, where you, you've got the 2016, then you have the 2016 with the updated MRIP, and then the, the latest update. In the Long Island Sound version of that, there was a lot of, across all of them, there, a lot of them were pretty congruent. They sort of matched more or less, um, maybe scaling a little different, but um, ups and downs kind of look the same, but it, yeah, thank you. So if you look at the bottom left on Long Island Sound, that's the one that kind of caught my eye where it departs from the 2016 update with the new MRIP, where that one seemed to be indicating a downward trend. And then, um, you know, the latest update sort of reverses that, makes it go up uh, by quite a lot. So I'm just wondering if you guys, uh, the technical team, discuss that. If you have any thoughts on um, what creates that the difference uh, between the models uh, in that case. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, so we did look at that within the um, subcommittee. Um, so there's quite a few factors playing in here. Um, so we didn't come up with a complete consensus as to how and why that um, was so dramatically different. Um, so we did have regulation changes that went in um, due to the last assessment. So that could account for some of the changes that we see there where we just saw some decreases in harvest allowing the SSB to increase. Um, we also did add a good chunk of data. So as you, if you actually look at the 2016 update um, in orange, you can kind of see it kind of leveling off. And then the new MRIP numbers, you can kind of see that going down a little bit. And then with the new additional data, it starts to pick that SSB back up. Um, so I, we also did look at the retrospective patterns and we did run analyses to determine if those if we required an adjustment due, due to the changes that we did see and we did see when we did those analyses for the four regions that um, the retrospective patterns fell within that 95 percent confidence interval um, indicating that we didn't we didn't have to look at the um you know that even though we did see that patterning throughout the period, it wasn't a significant change overall. Um, does that answer your question or do you have um, anything else you would like me to kind of elaborate on? No, I think that's good, Coley. It, it, so, you know, basically there's no, um, I, I was kind of wondering, you know, oh yeah, you know what happened was we updated a survey and, and the numbers were higher. I was wondering if there was something like that but it sounds like it's just an accumulation of factors that, um, and I'm imagining too, you know, with a forward, statistical forward projection model, um, you know, if you had some re-estimated recruitments that kind of change that trajectory a little bit moving forward um, in time, but I guess in any case, there was no like smoking gun just to, 
you know, use that term. Uh, it's probably just a, an accumulation of a number of factors. In any case, it's it's good news. So it's good to see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, go ahead, Adam. Great. Thanks very much. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, with regards to stock status for the New Jersey, New York White region, I just wanted to uh, confirm that as I looked at page 72 of the uh, assessment update itself that I believe was showing 95% confidence interval around the SSB estimates uh, that the upper that the SSB threshold is well within the uh, confidence that 95% confidence interval if I'm interpreting that correctly and in fact the upper bound of that confidence interval is in fact very close to the SSB target uh, you are correct there um, that region the um, let me just pull up my numbers for you we were overfished in that region um, but there certainly is very, very, very close to our threshold there. So there is a little bit of um, uh, confidence, or in, you know, the confidence interval for the status is slim, um, but we are very, very close to that threshold, changing the stock status for that region. All set, Adam. Yep, just wanted to make sure that I was interpreting that where that was correctly. Thank you very much. Very good. Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Coley, for this presentation. Um, I have a question relative to the short-term projections for the Long Island Sound region, uh, specifically with respect to the projections of F. Um, as noted in the presentation, the short-term projections show that there's only a 3% chance of the LIS region achieving the F target in three years. And when I first saw that, I guess I was a little surprised given that, you know, the if I have this right, the estimate of F for the terminal year in 2020 from the assessment is 0 0.3, which is certainly closer to F target 0 0.26 than F threshold 0 0.38. And then when I went and looked at the plots for the short-term projections for the Long Island Sound region. This would be figure 22 in the assessment, and I realize we're, you know, a bit handicapped here because this isn't, this wasn't a, a figure that was in the presentation. Um, it showed the estimate of F for 2021 as being 0 0.38, essentially right at the threshold, which is substantially higher than the 2020 estimate of 0 0.3. So I'm just wondering if you have any insight on why the short-term projection is showing such a higher F rate in 2021 relative to what the terminal year estimate was in 2020. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry, I'm pulling things up so I can comment a little bit better. Um, so we do see that um, for those projections, I can get back to you with a little bit more detail um, later on once I speak to um, the individuals who did the projections. Um, so I don't have the best answer for you in terms of um, why we see that um, probability changing there. Um, but I can certainly um, get back to our um, experts for that region and come back with a better answer for you, unless um, Katie or Kirby might have um, some additional insight on that particular uh, question. Uh, yeah, I think this is Katie. Sorry, I think it's I think it is related to kind of um, number one, the figures we're showing or that we're using for stock status is based on that three year average of F. Um, and so it's been declining for a bit and then but we're then using sort of that three year average of landings as well. Um, so which it is higher 
than kind of that terminal year of 2020. So the three-year average over that time period is going to be higher than than, I, than what it was in 2020, I believe. And so that's kind of just um, bumping that that up a bit, um, bumping that sort of that the effect on the population up a little bit compared to say just that three-year average and the the terminal year value of F when you're starting the projections going forward. So the projections going forward are handled a little bit differently than sort of that three-year smoothed average that we use to evaluate stock status. Um, but I think that, and I think that's also due to some of the uncertainty around um, and this shape of the distribution around that terminal year value of abundance going into the projections um, and um, fishing mortality coming out of the projections, if that makes sense. All set, Justin? Yeah, thanks. That was really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tony, I know we've got Jeff sitting there in, in the queue. Um, uh, is there are there any other board members who have their hands up at this point in time? <clears throat> that was the last of the board members. Uh, Jeff was the first member of the public with the question. Okay. I'm going to jump in just with a question, quick question for you, Carly. Just wondering if you could just comment, you know, in general, on uh, any of the constraints or, or or limitations that might be come forth with uh, having only one indice to work with for the Delmarva region. Um, just if there's any anything that we should know about the the results that are presented here as a result of only having uh, the one indice, the the catch pre-unit effort of, from MRIP. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so um, that is one thing that we did address in the risk and uncertainty uh, tool that I believe might be the two agenda items down. Um, so it is one thing that um, was considered, it did limit the number of sensitivity runs that could be uh, completed for that region as we were unable to drop indices um, to see their impact on the stock assessment. However, um, based on the uh, data we have available, what we have here with that one index is the um, is what we are able to complete at this time. Um, it is something that would be, um, you know, interesting and um, beneficial in the future to see if there were some more fisheries independent indices that could be created in that region. Um, but given what we have at the time, of, at the current uh, time, this is the best we, you know, the best data we have. Um, and even then, when we did look at some of the retrospective pattern patterning and did the analyses on that, there was not any significant um, patterning to cause us to do any sort of analysis to see if there was a better, uh, to see if those retrospective patterns were a concern. Um, so, yeah, it, it is um, unfortunate we couldn't do more with that region, but given what we have, this is the best we can do, and we did not see anything overly concerning um, based on the lack of indices for the region. Very good. Thank you. And, and like you said, that'll be covered in, in a, a little bit more in, under the agenda item dealing with the risk and un uncertainty tool. Um, okay, uh, Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. Jeff, just unmute yourself. Should be able to do that now. And Jeff Brust, if you're wanting to ask a question, you just need to unmute yourself on your end. Bill, maybe we can come yeah. back. He's not right. able to unmute himself, I don't think. Very good, Tony. Okay, so we will move to the next agenda item, which is item number five, consider management response to 2021 stock assessment update. Um, but before we open this topic for discussion, uh, Kirby is going to quickly review some items from Amendment 1, particularly uh, 4.2. 
point uh, one. Um, and, and these provide a procedure for developing management measures. And so Kirby, I believe you've got some slides to go through. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Maya's got a copy of it, so we'll just give her a second um, to pull it up on the screen. All right, so in fall to the stock assessment update, I'll provide the board with some management background to consider as they weigh a potential management response. So um, to provide a quick overview, I'll highlight two relevant parts of Amendment 1. The first is fishing mortality target in Section 2.7.1 on page 52. And the second is process for developing regional measures in Section 4.2.1 on page 68. Next slide. So based on the stock assessment update, I wanted to bring the board to the following language um, under section 2.71. It states the management board will evaluate the current estimates of F as determined by the most recent stock assessment with respect to its regional reference points before proposing any additional management measures. If current F exceeds the regional target, but is below the regional threshold, the board should consider steps to reduce F to the regional target level. And if the current F is below the regional target F, then no action would be necessary to reduce F. So for both the Long Island Sound and New Jersey, New York bite regions, the current estimate of F exceeds the target, but is below the threshold. Comparing this information to the last assessment update, F has decreased, which is important um, as an improvement from 2015 status. The other uh, regions, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, as well as the Delmarva, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia regions, their regional F estimate is below the regional target. The other consideration in this section is the probability of achieving the F target. It states that the management measures will be developed based on at least a 50% probability of achieving the F target. Uh, so as part of developing the risk and uncertainty decision tool for TATOG, the board will be providing input um, in a later agenda item uh, in terms of the preliminary report that was developed and included in supplemental materials and providing some further considerations on generating stock projections. Next slide. The other relevant section from the amendment that I wanted to flag for the board was in considering changes to the regional measures. So if a region is considering consistent measures across all states within a region, then a regional working group would be developed to discuss appropriate alternatives. Really, this regional working group is important, whether it's trying to set up the same exact measures and changing or if one state is interested in adjusting their measures. If a state wants to proceed that way, then um, under the general procedures within section 4.11 of conservation equivalency, that would be followed. And it's recommended similarly that this regional working group is convened in order to make sure that all the states within the region are on the same page and understanding what the proposed management measures are. And last, any um, modifications to these management measures, bag limit, minimum size, seasonal closures and quota would be reviewed by the TC and approved by the board. And once approved by the board, the measures can be implemented. So with that, I'll take any questions and turn it back over to you, uh, Chairman Hyatt, if there aren't any. Okay, just do we have any quick questions for Kirby? And and. Tony, any any hands? Sorry, I having trouble with my mute button. Adam Nowalski. Go ahead, Adam. Thanks. So with regards to what the amendment tells us to do, uh, we're basically saying that the Long Island Sound and New Jersey and New York Bight region, because they're currently above the target, uh, we should consider measures and whatever measures we consider need to have at least a 50% probability of achieving the target. Again, if I understand the presentation and, and what the amendment called for. And the presentation we had prior showed that projections have already been run 
that with current measures, both the Long Island Sound and the New Jersey, New York bite region are projected to be, to have greater than 50% probabilities of having F below the target. So where, where would that leave us? It, it seems that on the one hand, we're being told to consider changes, but we've already run some projections that say we're on track to have F below the target. Kirby, do you want to respond or do you want me to? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, so thanks, Adam, for the question. Uh, yes, in terms of what the, the current measures that were implemented as a part of Amendment 1 um, that has improved the stock status. And based on the language we have in the amendment, if there is interest um, in adjusting those measures, uh, then I think the board would need to consider how uh, to get them closer to the regional F target, uh, but it's it's just a consideration. There isn't a uh, a time frame in which they have to to meet that F target. In terms of the probability of achieving the F target, you know those uh, were just included, at, you know, as our status quo measures. If as part of the risk and uncertainty decision tool agenda item, which we'll get into more detail. Uh, we're going to look to the board for further guidance if there's interest in pursuing, um, you know, different probabilities than the, you know, default 50% from the amendment. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. If you, if that hopefully answers most of your questions. Adam, you good with that? Or at least did it That's sufficiently one. answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I'll just ask one follow-up, and that is uh, that should the risk and uncertainty tool ultimately that we as a board come up with a different number, uh, if the amendment is saying we need at least a 50% probability in our use of the risk and uncertainty tool, and, and maybe I'm jumping too far ahead here, tells us something different, are we going to need an addendum to the amendment at that point, or if it's just anything more conservative, then we would be okay. But if it came out with something more liberal, and where are, where's that going to play with this amendment mandated 50% probability? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, oh, you know, and, and I'm fine if the answer is just sit on that for another half hour and we'll get there. Yeah, I think we'll, I, that would be my suggestion. Okay, are there any other um, discussion points uh, regarding uh, management response? Tony, any uh, any hands? I see no other I see no other hands at this point, Bill. Okay, I'm 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 just going to interject something then, which may be my oversimplified view of of where this leaves us at this point. Recognizing that there, we're still uh, going to have ahead of us the discussion on the risk and uncertainty decision, but but my thought with regards to to process here was that any um, Following this meeting, any if any region wants to uh, consider a management change, that they would subsequently get together following this meeting, um, put together what they think is a, a reasonable approach, bring it to the next board meeting uh, for discussions. At which time, the board has the option uh, would have the option of um, moving it along to the technical committee for analysis. Um, both uh, traditional analysis as well as analysis under the risk and uncertainty tool, and then bringing it back to the following board meeting for approval, for discussion, consideration and discussion, and potentially approval by the larger board. So at least from a process standpoint, um, maybe a bit oversimplified, but I'm, I'm thinking that any, uh, you know, we're at the discussion point phase right now, and that any consideration or, or, or chance to implement uh, changes would be a 
two board meetings down the road. And I, I'll ask Kirby or Tony if they think that that anything in, in which I just, just said was maybe off target. I, I think that that can that can work, Bill. I mean, partially depends on the pleasure of the states and how they want to move forward. Okay, fair enough. Um, I do have an additional hand uh, that has sure. come up since you were chatting, uh, Dan McKiernan. Dan, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Tony. So, uh, Bill, I agree with you. I would just um, ask, as Tony mentioned, that this be a longer process. I'd want to do some scoping, you know, to our industry and also to uh, our sister state that we share that stock with and to try to move forward with something that, that both states are interested in to try to keep things uniform. And um, I think that might take a little bit more time than, than just one meeting coming up with proposals. I'd also have to deal with my uh, regulatory commission. So I'd want to get buy-in from them before I'd come to the commission with a proposal for changes. Right, thank you, Dan. And yes, I mean, like, like the assumption of what I said was that following this meeting, the regional work group, which would in, in your case involve both Massachusetts and Rhode Island would be, uh, would be working together to develop any type of proposal that would be subsequently brought to the uh, next board meeting. So I absolutely agree with you. And, and, and I think I was speaking in terms of what I would see as the fastest that the process could move forward. Any other hands, Tony? That is all. Okay, very good. Well, then we can move right into the next item on the agenda, um, which, uh, which is review and provide feedback on the risk and uncertainty decision tool for TATOG. And Jay, I believe you've got a presentation to, to, to provide. Yep. Uh, yeah, there it is, like magic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, got an update here for you on the risk and uncertainty policy. We've done a number of things since uh, we last spoke. And so this is an update uh, for you on that. Uh, and thanks, as always, to Sarah Murray, Kirby, and Katie Drew for uh, putting the presentation together. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a quick overview of what the uh, presentation covers, quick background, because I've said this to you about a thousand times, so I think everybody's got the background pretty well at this point. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the process, just to um, mainly to kind of let you know where we're at in that process. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, the report. Um, and so we did uh, a couple of things, including generating the weightings, and we've gotten some technical inputs for the decision tool. So um, got some cool stuff to report there, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions for the board, uh, seeking a little bit of input uh, from the board on a couple of the elements. Next slide. So background, uh, as you recall, the risk and uncertainty decision tool, uh, what it is, is it's a method for arriving at a recommended risk level for a stock. Um, and what it does is it takes the commission's priorities, the characteristics of the stock and the fishery, and in the end, what you produce is um, the risk level that we want to use when we start to identify management options. Our process to date has been more or less just sort of, you know, um, peppering the technical committee with uh, giving us a number of different potential probabilities. And this adds a little more structure uh, to the process um, and, and really um, requires us to be a little bit more thoughtful about why we're picking these different probabilities. Next slide. Um, so again, it's a the decision tool itself. It's a structured method. It 
in the end, it arrives at the commission's risk tolerance for a species, and they are, it can be species specific or should be species specific. Um, and then we take that information and we incorporate it into management. And so just a really important um, nuance here is the tool answers the question, how much risk is appropriate for the stock when making a management decision? What it doesn't do is assess the level of risk associated with specific management actions. So if we wanted to do that, we would have to do a management strategy evaluation. So to sort of look at different management options. So if we wanted to do three fish in a season that had 100 days and 14 inch fish versus some different configuration of um, of uh, you know management options and then compare those two things, that's something different. What we're doing here is we're saying we believe we need to be you know uh, precautionary to some degree based on uh, these attributes that we built into the decision tool. Next slide. So uh, we here is a, a graphic of the um, decision tool process. So we developed the decision tool. It incorporates different information related to risk and uncertainty for a species. And these are the uh, technical inputs that are within the decision tool. And it takes those technical inputs and combines it with the relative importance of that information. And that is the weighting. Uh, that's that weighting exercise that we just went through a couple of weeks ago. And in the end, we take those two things, we put them together and we come up with a recommended probability of achieving our management um, objectives. So uh, generally the way this is broken up is the board provides the input on the weighting. So we decide you know, what's more uh, important within our decision tool, whether it be the stock status information or the socioeconomic information. And then we get a little bit of help from our friends on the technical committee and the committee for economics and social science. Um, they provide the responses to the decision tool questions. They get input from the advisory panel, but we also, as the board, have the purview to make adjustments to their inputs um, if warranted. And, and that's another nice aspect of this is the board maintains control of the process uh, in total, however, we have to be explicit about what we're doing if we're making a change um, to any of the technical inputs that are provided to us by our experts. Uh, and it's an iterative process. So, um, you know, we that's that little loopy arrow on the left-hand side there. Um, the board can provide feedback on the weightings and the decision tool um, to adjust things uh, as needed, and that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about today. Next slide. So the risk and uncertainty process, it's made up of two parts, basically. We have uh, the developing the species specific decision, decision tool, and then we have the second part, which is actually using that decision tool for um, helping us with a management decision. So what we've done so far has been to develop the tool, um, or as is the case for TATA, we developed four uh, region-specific decision tools. Um, we got the stock status inputs. Those came out of the 2021 assessment update that uh, Coley so eloquently just told us all about. Um, the technical committee scored and provided input on the sections on model uncertainty, management uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, uh, and then the ecosystem and trophic importance components of the tool. And then the Committee for Economics and Social Science scored the socioeconomic importance components. And those are the commercial economic value, commercial community dependence, recreational desirability, and recreational community. Uh, the AP was also consulted on the technical inputs, but did not provide any feedback. Um, so either they were satisfied with it or um, didn't, uh, didn't see a need to comment. 
And then we, the board, provided the weightings, and we did that via a poll. And uh, for those who couldn't make the webinar where we did the poll live, uh, there was also a survey that was issued to the board members. So we did all this work. Um, and so now we're at the sort of the second part here, and that is if a management action is initiated or is being considered, will then implement, implement the second part of the process. And that will be to use this decision tool. Um, and so what will happen is additional analyses will be conducted. And uh, from those extra analyses, we will produce the recommended probability of achieving uh, the management uh, you know, targets or the, the reference um, points that we're trying to achieve with our management um, changes. Next slide. So now I'll get into the report itself. Um, I'll probably try and go through this relatively quickly and then we can come back to any specific areas that anybody wants to. Um, so next slide. Here is a table uh, of the weightings themselves. So um, these are basically the, all of the components within the decision tool. You've got your SSB information, the threshold and target, the F threshold and target, um, and then all of those other components there. And so what you can see uh, there in the first, um, actually it's the second column, are the survey scores. So you can see, remember the survey is on this scale from zero to five. And then we took all of the scores that all of the board members uh, gave and then averaged them to come up with uh, the overall survey score. So you can see the SSB threshold, that was uh, an important one for us. The F threshold, that was another important one for us. And then uh, ecosystem importance was one of the lower ones. And, you know, in the case of Tatog, that probably makes um, some degree of, of sense. And so those are the survey scores. And then what happens is you, from those, those get um, kind of prorated and developed into our weightings. And so you can see with uh, the higher weightings, you see those at the SSB threshold, the F threshold, which you know correspond to the high uh, survey scores. And then uh, ecosystem importance, you can see, um, has the, the lowest weighting. And so you can see how we, how this all kind of came out in the end. Um, and remember, we went in with everything being weighted equally at 0 0.1. And you can see how things have adjusted from those um, that kind of equal weighting scenario. Next slide. This is just a graphical representation of how the information um, kind of sorted itself out. Uh, just to orient you to these plots, uh, it's a, um, you've got all of the different components and then the x-axis is your um, one to five, sorry, not zero to five, but one to five scoring. Um, and then you have the frequency is what the bars represent um, going up the y-axis there. And so the, the way you can kind of look at these is to determine if you've got, um, you know, any situation where the, the scores are really spread out um, across the whole range. And you can kind of see that for the, um, long-term recreational one down at the bottom um, you know most of the scoring was at the score of four but you had responses across the whole range as um, opposed to model uncertainty which you know most of the scores were between three and four so it just gives you a sense of how consistent we were as board members with the with our weightings in these different areas and from my eye, I think, uh, with a couple of exceptions, we were pretty good. Uh, the vast majority um, of folks were kind of scoring things within a point or two of that, um, of that one to five scale. Next slide. 
So uh, now we're gonna go region by region on the technical inputs. Here is the Mari region, um, and you can see the stock status um, information. Those come directly out of the stock assessment. Um, and you know this is the exactly the information that Coley was just talking to us about. So those, um, the, the P with the little parenthetical after them, that's the probability of SSB being less than the SSB threshold. So for the case of Mari, there's a 0% uh, probability of that um, and so on and so forth. So the only one there where there's any information is the probability that the SSB is less than the SSB target um, and there's a small probability that that's the case, about 6.9% probability. Everything else is uh, zero. Um, so those get plugged in directly to those first four uh, questions. And then you've got your next component is the model uncertainty. That score right about the middle of the range there. And I won't read all of those out, but you can see the some of the reasons why uh, the technical committee scored this in the way that that they did but this is roughly in the, the center of the, the range there uh, management uncertainty a little bit less but still pretty close to the center of the range um, and then environmental uncertainty towards the lower end of the range so that had a lower score and then again, ecosystem trophic importance that uh, had the lowest score at 0.8. Um, it says no known key ecosystem trophic rules. Um, I think that's uh, accurate. Um, I think, you know, Tatog does have importance. Um, obviously in the ecosystem, I guess it's this notion of, you know, connections and, and impacts within the ecosystem. There's not a lot of information on that for Tatog. Next slide. Here is Long Island Sound. So in this case, um, if you're looking at the table at the top, um, you've got information in, in all of the boxes there um, for the probability of fishing mortality and SSB being um, you know, within um, range of the thresholds and the targets there. So you can see those. Um, the model uncertainty, pretty consistent with the Mari region. Um, right about the center of that zero to five range. Management uncertainty, a little bit greater uh, for this um, region for management uncertainty um, and uh, environmental uncertainty and ecosystem trophic importance are at the lower uh, end of that range. Next slide. Here's the New Jersey and New York bite. Again, uh, there are probabilities of um, exceeding or being below the different uh, thresholds and targets there. And you can see those in the table um, consistent with the other areas with regard to model and management uncertainty being sort of central to the uh, scoring range there. And again, environmental and ecosystem importance uh, lower end of the range. Um, and there's a lot of consistency in the reasoning um, with these for the different, uh, you know, the different uh, areas or regions rather. Uh, I, I should highlight, so one of the reasons the management uncertainty gets upweighted for both Long Island Sound and New Jersey, New York bite is the um, illegal harvest uh, is believed to be um, significant concern uh, in these areas. And then beyond that, everybody knows Tatog has a really high recreational component. And, and just because of that, there's always going to be management uncertainty based on the way we understand our recreational fisheries. Next slide. And last but not least, Delmarva, you've got a little bit of information uh, in the stock status uh, boxes there for probabilities, um, generally in good shape in the Delmarva region with regard to that. Uh, here, the model uncertainty got a little bit of a higher score than the other, um, the other areas. One of the main uh, reasons for that is that there's no fishery independent index in this uh, region and the uh, retrospective was um, 
kind of in that risky direction where it's uh, what is it? It's under predicting F, over predicting SSB with regard to the retrospective um, patterns there. Um, middle of the range there for management uncertainty, and then uh, low end of the range for environmental uncertainty and ecosystem and trophic importance. Next slide. Um, a little bit about the socioeconomic criteria, and this is just a, a reminder. Um, so we have the important scores. Uh, this, that's what I'm going to be reviewing in the next uh, slide um, coming up here. So that part is completed. And then there's uh, management effect scores, and those are only calculated if there will be a management action. Because the management effect is a multiplier, uh, the total socioeconomic score can't be calculated unless there is a potential management action. Um, and so basically the total score, putting those two things together is essentially characterizing what the socioeconomic effects would be of implementing the level of precaution indicated by the rest of the decision tool. Um, so you, you kind of can't get out in front uh, on that one. You have to sort of have something in mind before you can um, do the, the second component of the socioeconomic criteria. But we do have the important scores. So next slide, please. So um, these were calculated based on coast-wide socioeconomic indicators. And so in other words, I don't have four slides here. There's only one. Um, and that's because there, this is done once and applied to all of the regions. Um, and so for the commercial economic value scored at the lower end of the range, um, and that's because, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the, um, the commercial economic value, while important uh, for those fishers who prosecute this fishery, um, in the overall grand scheme of things, uh, it's not a you know a huge fishery in any um, in the area from Virginia to Mass in particular. Uh, commercial community dependence is at the higher end, um, and that's out of four, um, and that's because the commercial community dependence for the top ten communities is about thirty five point one percent. So kind of um, I think it's you know. The communities, again, that do depend on Tatog, they're, they're kind of dependent on them. I think it's generally fisheries that are kind of cobbling together small scale fisheries throughout the year and, and Tatog is an important component of that. Uh, so that had uh, kind of a higher score. Uh, moving down to the recreational part of this, recreational desirability is about the middle of the range there. Um, you know, so it's, um, Pretty important. Uh, I think folks who, who fish for Tatog are passionate about it. Um, there's just not as many of them as say um, there are for you know those that fish for striped bass, for instance. And then the recreational community dependence is towards the lower end of the scale there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that was scored about um, about the two. And uh, next slide. And this is uh, the end of it for the presentation here. Um, and this is looking for a little bit of feedback. So you've got the report. Are there any questions or feedback on the weightings or the technical inputs? So that's something that we're looking to um, get feedback on. Um, the next steps. So we'd like to know if the board would like to task the technical committee or the committee for economic and social science with any additional analyses. Um, so if there will be a management action, uh, would you like us to produce the recommended probability to um, help with that process? Or if there won't be a management action, uh, as we just saw earlier, a lot of really good news. So there's uh, conceivably, we might not be doing much here, but, um, if we don't, uh, what we could do is kind of produce some hypothetical scenarios to sort of illustrate how we would have used the, the decision tool to kind of go um, from the beginning to the end with Tatog here. Um, 
Uh, another potential next step to consider maybe beyond the scope of, of this board, but we might want to think about beginning the development for some other uh, species, you know, weak fish or striped bass or something like that. And then finally, uh, we went through the process for Tatog. We would be interested in any feedback on the process itself. For instance, the little webinar that we had, the survey that was sent out, um, pretty much any, anything um, with that last one, we'd be interested in getting some feedback. And with that, Mr. Chair, happy to take uh, any questions. Great, Jay. Thank you. And, and, and I will say that with, with each and every presentation that I hear on the risk and uncertainty tool, I think I understand it a little bit better. The bad news is I still there's still, still a little ways to go before I'm totally comfortable with it. Um, Tony, have we got any, 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 any hands up? Uh, basically, we're looking for comments and questions for Jay. Any type of feedback on what's been presented? I have one hand, Tom Fody. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, when I looked at the, the commercial side, we put an economic value on on what they would loss would be would be the losses in the recreational community. You did not say the impact. You know, nobody buys the green crabs that they, the tackle stores are selling. The charter boats can't sell if we basically if they can't sell if we don't have a season or. Or sometimes it's the only thing that we can fish for during, you know, the gaps between sea bass and summer flounder. So the economics might not seem as great, but it seems to be very important because then you don't have trips going out. So I'm just trying to understand why we didn't include that. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, an awesome question, Tom. I in um, why we didn't include it, I just don't think it. Um, you know, of course, we all understand these things. I think in one regard, we are trying to keep things sort of high level and tractable for our first run through here. But I, I think this is good feedback that we can sort of take back. And that is um, because the, the dependent scores were, you know, were high um, on the commercial side. And I, I think that was high without thinking about these indirect in, impacts like bait and tackle shops. So um, in any case, I think I'll take your question as feedback that we can go back and, and think a little bit more about and try and incorporate it. Because I, I agree with you, it's like super specialized, right? So you have things that occur on the Tatog fishery that don't occur in any other fisheries like green crab um, sales and, and things like that. So. Um, We'll kind of take that one back and, and think about how to shoehorn that into the process here. I think it's a good comment. This is Sarah Murray. Is it all right if I chime in here for a moment? Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Jason was saying about um, the socioeconomic component. A, a piece of this that he sort of alluded to is that we were trying to come up with a way to make this um, workable on a management timeline. So for the socioeconomic component, we were looking for things that could be indicators of the general um, importance, uh, for lack of a better word, of the commercial or, or recreational fisheries. So they're not necessarily um, capturing every dynamic of it, but they might be a way to get at the scale or the impact of the fishery. Um, for commercial, we have a little bit of an advantage that we at least have X vessel value data. Um, so that's what we ended up using uh, for the commercial indicator. Uh, but I will note that is not an economic impact assessment. So that is only um, price of landed to tog it doesn't include anything um, anything beyond that the broader economic impacts and and for recreational we don't really have um, something to parallel that on a coast-wide basis that would be allowed uh, be, be able to be used for for an indicator so what we did was look at um, directed trips instead uh, because that was the data that we had. Um, 
That said, the uh, socioeconomic indicators or the socioeconomic components are set up uh, for the indicators to be a starting point, so a, a, a way to set, sort of sort the different species, but there is room for the SES or the board or, or AP providing impact, uh, input to say, we don't think that this indicator is actually capturing the reality of the fishery. So in the example of the TOG, if we think that the TRIPS actually isn't really capturing either the uh, sort of importance on a coastal scale or or the community dependence, if it's not capturing some of those dynamics there, and we want to sort of override the indicator, that's, that's something that we've written into how the socioeconomic um, components work. We would just document that change in the report, include sort of justifications for why we're doing that and, and change the score accordingly. So hopefully that helps clarify uh, the, the socioeconomic component and, and the recreational and why there isn't necessarily dollar value associated there, though we know there's definitely economic impact. Yeah, can I follow up, Doug? Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, that's one of my major concerns. You know, we're, we're designing a tool because of lack of data. And over the years, you know, we've been talking about management plans, and we always get to the point where it talks about the recreational, social, economic impact. As we always say, it's the best data we have available. And it's, it's so we're trying to basically do things that we never basically count the economic data that's in the recreational community and poorly in the commercial community. So I see all these tools putting in because of lack of resources we have to get the data necessary to actually do things. And so we look for tools that will let get us around though, but we're still lacking the data we need to basically make decisions. And that's and this is not helping that with, uh, in my estimation. Next, Bill, you have Roy Miller. Go ahead, Roy. Thank you, Bill. Um, this comment or question actually probably relates more to Kirby's presentation rather than Jay's, although um, perhaps the answer to Kirby's also um, applies to Jay's presentation as well. And specifically, I'm concerned about the relative lack of, of um, fishery independent surveys in the Delmarva region. Um, there is a Delaware Bay trawl survey, but I presume that that data is, wasn't particularly useful for this purpose uh, because probably because of a relatively low catch rate of tautog in that survey is somewhat of an unusual event to catch one so th that's one presumption which may or may not be correct um, but i'm wondering how about federal offshore trawl surveys they had no utility in providing an in fishery independent uh, mechanism for estimating tautog relative abundance and so the question is, why do why weren't the federal surveys, offshore trawl surveys, used? Thanks, Roy. Who, who wants to take a stab at answering that question? Mr. Chair, this is Jay. Maybe I'll lead off just sort of um, topically on the uh, decision tool because I, I think there's a relevant response there, but then. On the technical question that Roy has, hopefully someone else will jump in, maybe Katie or, or Kirby. Um, I don't know if Coley's still on, she might be able to help too. Um, but, I, you know, as far as the decision tool goes, um, just at the highest level, Roy, of your question, you know, with the lack of a fishery independent index for that particular reason, uh, region rather, that's actually one of the real beauties of this tool. And that is you can, because of that fact and, and why that is, hopefully we'll hear about that in a minute, but because of that fact, you can be more precautious in that area and the tool sort of built 
to do that. And in fact, it did exactly that in the scoring uh, by the technical committee. They um, you know, ranked that um, managed, um, the uh, uncertainty a little higher because of that uh, in that component. So that's exactly what the tool is built to do is to accommodate and to prescribe a risk tolerance for exactly this type of, of a scenario. So I just wanted to sing the, the attributes of the decision tool <laughs> with this particular topic, but uh, if anybody has a direct response to the question about a uh, trial survey, I'll, I, I have like a sense based on my history with the talk that I'll let the folks who are more involved more recently answer. Yeah, thanks, Jay. So if Coley is still on or, or Kirby, if anybody can jump in and, and address Roy's question as to why federal data sources weren't used. And one, once Roy's question is answered, I'm going to have a question and then we can go back to Tony, who's ever uh, has their hand up. Um, so, Coley, Kirby, anybody have an answer to the question that Roy asked? Hey, Bill, it's Kirby. I'll jump in and just say that, you know, this assessment update updates the, the last update from, it was 2016, and, and that data wasn't used then. Um, so that's the simple answer. We're just updating the surveys that were used in the last assessment. Um, but going back to the previous assessment, that a decision why that wasn't, you know, looked at, I, I have to go back and, and double check. Maybe Katie has more insight um, from the, you know, the, the first benchmark uh, back in 2014. Yeah, basically the, the answer is we looked at it for the last benchmark assessment and those federal offshore trawl surveys just really don't catch TATOG. Um, trawl surveys in general are not great for TATOG because they are so structure oriented um, and the encounter rates in the in the NOAA surveys were very low. So you just get, you know, one or two a year um, or sometimes none. So we decided that, you know, those those surveys were not providing um, accurate indices of abundance because they just couldn't catch them out there. Very good. So, so Jay, jump to a question that I have. I'm, I'm intrigued by your suggestion of hypothetical scenarios. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I'm still, still struggling somewhat with getting comfortable and uh, with a level of understanding as to what the risk and uncertainty tool would provide us and how that would be applied. And you know, in your slide, you ask, are there any questions regarding weightings? Are there any questions regarding technical inputs? I myself, I'm not really sure if I have any questions given given that I, I don't think I have a practical understanding of this tool yet. So I was wondering if you could just talk for a minute about what you would envision in hypothetical scenarios and um, well, how you would envision doing it playing out. And if, if, if you or others on the board think that that is a useful way forward with this. I don't know how many people are struggling with this in the same manner that I am, but uh, but if you could uh, talk about that for a minute, it'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and um, maybe uh, Sarah could jump in um, as well. Um, I don't know if, if the ASMFC team had, had talked more explic explicitly about uh, this um, internally at ASMFC, but uh, first I will um, sort of empathize with you a little bit. I, I struggle with these sorts of things in the abstract um, and it's nice to see a good application and that's exactly why we have that second you know sub bullet there um, it's you know it's sort of a good problem to have and that is maybe we won't need to actually take any management action um, because the news is good uh, by and large there may be an opportunity there so it may be a moot point you know maybe we will do do something here, but uh, you know the direct answer to your question is that's the value of doing the hypotheticals is so that we can run this process from beginning to end, so everyone can see a full application of it. Um, you know, even in the case that uh, we might not be making any management changes, and so I think that's the point where you'd say, "Oh, all right," you know what the decision tool is going to tell us is you know if we want to um, 
achieve some level of um, reduction in fishing mortality, it's going to give us the probability that we should set that at, and then the management measures will use that as the target. So that's kind of the, there's like two more steps that this gets um, rolled into. So that, you know, that's the point of doing the hypotheticals is, is for exactly the reason you, you highlight, and that is to run it from beginning to end so that we can see the full application uh, of the tool rather than, you know, kind of ending here and having it remain um, sort of an abstract um, idea. But Sarah, I don't know if, if you guys talked a little bit about what hypotheticals we might um, be thinking about if we don't end up taking any management actions uh, this time around. Yeah, we did talk uh, about it uh, to a certain extent, um, though we probably need to flesh these ideas out a, a little more if we go down that road. But uh, road, but I, I think the idea is essentially to give the board a more uh, fully fleshed out uh, view of what this tool results in, and then also what sort of tinkering with different pieces of the tool would do. Um, so as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, this can be an iterative process. So when it comes to the weightings, for example, uh, you all provided input on that, but there would be an opportunity that if you didn't quite uh, agree with how that landed, that those could be changed. Or in the example of the socioeconomic, component where there might be concerns that it's, you know, one of the components wasn't capturing things, there could be a chance of, of tweaking those. Um, so uh, some examples to just show what it would look like if you did change the weightings, for example, or if you did change a score on, on a socioeconomic component would be um, what we were thinking of in terms of the hypothetical scenarios, you know, we don't haven't uh, sorted out exactly what those would look like. We want to steer away from, uh, I guess, getting confusion around actual management uh, versus versus what is happening. But the intent would be uh, uh, different scenarios to help the board understand what the knobs they have to turn on uh, in this decision tool would be. Well, thank you, Jay and Sarah. From my perspective, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, some Running some hypothetical scenarios to take this from the abstract to the practical, um, that includes some level of sensitivity analysis towards the variables, I think would, would, would you know, I'm talking for everybody here, and I, I hope there's agreement. If not, let me know. But but I'm thinking that that would take everybody a long way down the road towards understanding this and better understanding its practical application. Um, I guess my question to you would be, do you need anything from the board in order to proceed in that direction um, at this point in time? Or is there is there agreement? If, if, is there agreement amongst the members of the board that that's a good direction to, to move in? Before Sarah answers that question, Bill, John Clark put his hand up during this discussion, so I don't know if he has um, a question related. Go ahead, John. Maybe John didn't have his hand up. <laughs> He just took it down. Oh, okay. I don't know where. Let's see. Did I lose him? Uh, there he is. His hand is up again. Uh, hold on, John. Let me unmute you. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I think I was starting to talk. I put my hand down, and then I got muted. So okay. uh, can you hear me now? We can. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just saying that I, I agree with uh, Bill. I'd really like to see these hypothetical scenarios. And I think, I was just kind of curious also if they did start being used more often, um, maybe Jay can answer this. Could you get to the point where the system could inadvertently be kind of gamed where 
you know, let's say you had states that didn't want to see action taken and they both say that the, you know, put very low weights on certain of the items, whereas other areas where they might be much more concerned about it, they put very heavy weights on those, would it kind of cancel each other out? And then you end up with almost like a neutral weighting there. Yeah, uh, good question, John. So I think there are, you know, two two things to answer. I think um, that could happen mathematically. I think it would take a pretty concerted and, and coordinated cabal <laughs> to sort of, um, you know, one of the nice things about the, the survey is we all sort of took it independently and, and then everything gets sort of averaged um, together. Um, and so my hope is, you know, any one individual who's trying to do something nefarious <laughs> would get um, sort of, you know, it would come out in, in the wash. Um, you know, Jay, so I think I, I worded it poorly. I didn't mean, you know, like an intentional system, but I just meant, you know, let's say one region thinks the stock is doing well and another region doesn't think it's doing well. Uh, does it, you know, and, and there is some very much a subjective element to this whole thing. Could those type of things happen though, where it just kind of works out, you end up with a uh, a neutral recommendation based on the fact that everybody's kind of canceling each other out? Yeah, okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, I was being a little cynical as well, I apologize. That probably wasn't the way you worded it. So- Well, you are uh, right to be cynical though, because those things could happen, but. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in answer to your question, so in the case of Tatog, again, you know, maybe you didn't mean it this way, but the, the regions are independent from each other. They're, they're succinct units. Um, so, you know, within a region, if people felt differently about the stock status, yeah, that could happen. And in fact, you sort of see that um, in the case of the socioeconomic factors, they sort of um, offset each other. Um, so, it, it can happen, but that's, uh, again, I think that's the opportunity we have here is for you to look at the stuff and say, hey, I don't think that looks quite right. I think, um, you know, maybe we all didn't understand this correctly and we adjust the weight, but we have to do it transparently and get the consensus of our fellow board members to adjust that, that weighting post-survey. Um, so, you know, I think there's, yeah, it can happen mathematically, absolutely, uh, but there are ways to account for that. Um, and the nice aspect of the process we've developed here is you have to be really transparent about it. Thanks, Jay. And it does, that, that's real helpful because I figured it probably end up being an iterative process, but it, you know, there is a lot of subjectivity involved in the process. Yep, for sure. Tony, do we have any hands up now? We don't have any other hands up, so you can go back to Sarah's to answer okay. your question about what we would need to do. Yeah. yeah. Just, go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the question really comes down to whether we want to look at hypothetical scenarios for the next board meeting or whether we want to kind of produce the real world recommended probability for each of these regions. Um, and the distinction there is if we're, we're going through the uh, full real exercise of producing the recommended probability that involves um, working with the TC uh, to produce harvest levels uh, associated with the different probabilities and looking at the uh, potential change in in harvest levels and feeding that back through the management change effects uh, to then uh, produce the recommended probability in the hypothetical scenarios at least how we had uh, talked about it uh, we rather than working with the actual projections we would probably look at just different hypothetical percent changes for example um, so that's kind of the nuance there of whether we want to continue forward um, 
with this uh, and and work with the TC to do with the actual projections or whether we just want to look at some hypothetical scenarios if um, you know a, a sort of middle option is to say we want to look at hypothetical for now um, for uh, and and do the potentially do the real option later if we are actually looking at m management possibilities or, uh, or or both for the next um, scenario not to give ourselves uh, too much work there but um, I think that's kind of the real question we have for you is do you just want hypotheticals so that you can understand the tool or are we wanting to take the next step to produce some potential probabilities to actually inform potential management um, actions yeah it sounds to me like there's a little bit of a catch-22 there in the sense that they the the even if they are hypothetical they have to be real enough to enable people to in, envision the use of the tool in a manner that leads to greater understanding familiarity and comfort so um so yeah i i, I don't know exactly off the top of my head what type of, of guidance to give in response to the question you just asked and I think I will throw it out to the group for for further consideration. You have Adam Nowalski, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Adam. If it is not the intention of this board to change management measures, uh, particularly I think in the more restrictive direction for Long Island Sound and New Jersey, New York Bite. Is there another species board that might get more out of doing the hypotheticals in the near term and or possibly using this in the near term if this board doesn't intend to actually use it and it's just purely hypothetical? Jay, Sarah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, um, um, my immediate reaction, uh, Adam, is that it's, you know we've gone this far with developing it, and a lot of work has gone into developing it with regard to TOG. And and uh, Jay and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but this tool could be used uh, not just in assessing more restrictive. Uh, management measures, but also could be useful in addressing liberalization of future management. Am I correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, so it can be used in either direction. Uh, and perhaps as a uh, note on workload, the hypothetical scenarios at least as we had envisioned them shouldn't be uh terribly complicated to produce just as a, a way to visualize and maybe uh, wrap it up even if uh the board is not produced uh looking to take a, a management action so um at least to produce a few of those just so that for future reference you have a sense of how this would have turned out uh, wouldn't be too much of a, a workload. Uh, when it comes to um, whether or not you know the board is is I, I can't speak to whether or not uh, sort of the, in regards to the board actions specifically. So uh, that's up to the purview of the board. Um, but uh, producing the hypotheticals wouldn't be particularly complicated. The uh, Producing the actual recommended probability is a bit more work. It's still feasible uh, for the next board. So it just depends on how the board is seeing this uh, and whether it's it's useful for the board. Thank you. Uh, any other hands, Tony? Uh, we have Justin Davis and then Adam Nowalski. Okay, go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess I feel that seeing some hypotheticals might be helpful in sort of really bringing home to the board whether or not this is a tool we want to adopt and use in an actual live fire management action in the future. I, I do think we need to be careful that 
moving forward with hypothetical runs of this tool is not sort of viewed as a pretext to management action when the board has not yet made a decision to take any management action at this point relative to Tautog. So uh, I'm not in favor of sort of just stopping at this point and not doing something further until such time as a management action might be taken uh, because I think we need we, we need a more detailed look at how this might play out to make the most informed decision about whether this is something we want to use in a future management action. So I, I guess I would be in favor of some hypothetical applications of this to give sort of a fuller look at, at what it might actually look like if used in a management action, if that's helpful. Thank you, Justin. Um, yes, it was helpful. Uh, Adam, go ahead. Like others who have spoken, I, I am completely interested in continuing to see this move forward. I, I'm not looking for a full stop on this. Uh, I think a lot of great work has been done. I think there's definite applications to this. Uh, I am thinking, however, that it was not this board's request to have this tool brought to us first. I believe it was ultimately a policy board decision when they looked at the tool uh, to say, hey, this is a species that we think this would make sense to go to. Uh, that decision was made when we had information about stock status. This last assessment, I think, has significantly changed uh, the commission's perspective on where stock is. And I think, again, that's a, a great position to be in. I'd rather be in that position than the other direction. So I'm leaning towards thinking maybe the best approach here is not for this species board to be making this decision today. Uh, but for staff to spend some more time thinking about what is the best application for this at this point. Is there a better application than the Tautog board at this point? Uh, and ultimately have the policy board make the decision whether they want an individual species board dealing with hypotheticals uh, or whether they think there's a better use of this moving forward uh, in the near term. Okay, so so it's clear that some folks um, do believe that we should move forward with some hypothetical scenarios within this board. Uh, take further look at as Adam has suggested that uh, we move this over to the policy board to see where would be the most appropriate place to do some uh, additional and further development and analysis. Uh, what do other folks think? So. Bill, I just want to step in really quick and just, you know, in response to Adam, you know, Adam, you are correct that the policy board thought that the TATOG board would be a great uh, second run of the risk and uncertainty tool or test run, I should say, um, because of the previous doc status. We had an assessment coming up where we thought we might have to make a management response. If we go back to the policy board and they we would have to start all over again, which would be a you know potentially considerable amount of time before we then do another test run. And it's been an, several years in the making this tool. And so I think you know from the staff's perspective, we would we would like to try to be able to bring something back to the policy board in terms of like how informative the tool was for the board so that they could make a decision on whether or not they want to approve the, the tool for, for use across the board for all of the species. So doing a test run could achieve that for you know, giving feedback to the to, to the policy board, I think. So I'll just put that notion out there. Say we could come back to the board with us, like just make something up to say we needed to do reductions for top to tog in one of the regions, and here's a list of scenarios um, based on some hypothetical to to provide that information to you all to see how it would um, work out. Um, that said, 
I'll let the board chew on that. And Tom Fody has raised his hand. Okay, uh, thank you, Tony. And go ahead, Tom. I know it's supposed to be hypothetical and we, we go through the exercise, but I have watched what happens in hypotheticals over the years and the tendency of somebody jumping on it for their own, whatever their own uh, philosophy is going or what direction they want to go. And they start using the numbers on a hypothetical, which is never meant to be used. And it winds up in a, in, in a lot of controversy going on. That's my concern here. Um, and because fisheries management is no longer done in a bubble, but done on the internet a lot of times. And um, I'm always concerned when you put out things to the public that's hypothetical, because some people just jump on and say, that's the truth. Thank you, Tom. But I, I will add that that doing it clearly up front as a hypothetical does actually mitigate some of that risk that you had suggested, as opposed to jumping in and doing real life scenarios, maybe where you don't intend to take management action. So um, I would argue that that in order to protect against what you're concerned about, that it's actually better to work with hypothetical scenarios um, at the stage in the process where you're still trying to understand the, the usefulness of a tool. Um, at this point, what I'm going to do is suggest that we do take one additional, one a next step in this, this process. And I'm going to suggest as a, as a board that, that we um, should go forward and at least move one step forward and allow for the folks that have dedicated a lot of time and effort working on this to prepare some hypothetical scenarios um, with the understanding that these will be presented uh, to us at the at the next uh, board meeting. And if it's not practical by the next board meeting, at least at a subsequent board meeting. And um, it, I don't think we need a motion here unless there is a strong objection to this or any objection to this. So I will throw that out uh, for folks to see if, uh, if, if members of the board are comfortable moving forward at this time in that manner. Tony, have we got any hands? Uh, wait, sorry, we have uh, two hands, Justin Davis and then Chris Wright. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just offer one thought. I, I don't know if this is useful or not, but I wonder if in in doing some hypothetical scenarios, if it might be useful and perhaps a little less, I don't know what the word is, but if, if, if we did something retrospective where, if, for instance, we looked at the management decisions that were made after the last assessment, which I think we're all based on a 50% probability of reaching F target by some timeline, if there's a possibility of looking at the available information from the assessment at that time, coupled with this tool and sort of determining whether we would have chosen a different probability for achieving F target at that time. And in that case, we sort of have a real world comparison of sort of what we did under the quote unquote old model versus what we would have done under this model that also avoids sort of the issue here of, you know, not wanting to sort of create a pretext for management action at this point that at this point that the board hasn't shown any indication they want to take. So that's just a thought I'm throwing out there. So that's a very interesting suggestion. And uh, Jay and Sarah, does that seem like something that could be within uh, uh, your wheelhouse to uh, to address in that manner? Yeah, I'll, um, I think I'll provide a little more context on the hypotheticals that we are thinking of and how those would work. Um, so in the real process, we would take the probability that is produced from just the sort of science, uh, scientific biology based components of so the stock status, uh, model uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, ecosystem trophic importance, and then also the management uncertainty. Those would produce a probability without the socioeconomic component. And we would look at the, um, with projections, what harvest level would achieve that probability and see how that's stacked up to the status quo. Uh, so in terms of whether that would be an increase or a decrease or 
uh, what percentage that would be. And that would be what is used to uh, produce the uh, that final socioeconomic score. In the hypothetical scenarios that we're talking about here, we're essentially breaking this, this component of the decision tool. So you, you can't take the hypothetical scenario and say, okay, we want to apply it. Instead, what we're doing is we're taking out that component of looking at um, the harvest level um, from just those TC components. We're not doing that. Instead, we're saying, okay, what if the uh, scores that the TC produced suggested a 5% a decrease? What would the management effect sc score for uh, the CES component be? What if the TC component said a 10% increase? What would the management effect score be? So it's, it's, it isn't, there wouldn't be any justification for using that in a real, in a real world scenario. Um, when it comes to looking at a past, um, like the past uh, management decisions, uh, we could look at the percent decreases, for example, and use that for one of the hypothetical scenarios, but actually reproducing the full decision tool based on the, uh, the, uh, reality of the time of the last uh, management decision would be uh, a, a lot of additional work because we would need to produce all of those scores based on that time and go back and do the socioeconomic scores based on that time period and things like that. So it sort of depends on exactly what you're thinking um, in terms of using that past scenario. Hopefully that uh, help to explain things a little more, but if you have additional questions, please let me know. Thank you, Sarah. And it, it's clear that what you're suggesting is is very sensitive to the concerns that, that Tom Fody uh, brought up. And um, and it is consistent with, with some of the suggestions that have been made uh, so far in the discussion. So at, at this point, what I'm gonna do is just ask the board if there is any objection to having um, the folks move forward with the risk and, and, and risk and uncertainty tool to look at some hypothetical scenarios as Sarah has described and to report back to this board at a subsequent meeting. Is there any objection to that? I see no hands. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Then we, we will move in that direction. And I will just ask, is there any further discussion that needs to be had or that people are interested in having on this topic? Chris Wright had his hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I, I support the going forward, but what, what, what time frame were you thinking? The next meeting or which meeting are we going to hear back on this uh, scenario analysis? So I'll jump in. I was thinking the next meeting, but I think uh, given the discussion that's been had, I, th I think uh, really depends upon um, Sarah and Jay and the folks who are going to be hands on on this, letting us know whether or not that's possible. Um, Sarah, is there a, a do you have an answer today or is that something that you're going to need to think about a little bit? Yeah, a uh, winter meeting should be feasible for for coming up with some hypothetical scenarios to look at. So as long as that makes sense with um, ISFMP and, and their agendas for that meeting, uh, it shouldn't be an issue to have that analysis ready for then. Very good. Any other hands? No other hands. Hand. I just wanted to jump in and say, you know, so based in summary, what I'm hearing is we don't have any feedback from the board on the report in terms of weightings or technical input at this stage. Uh, you know, there's, as you've suggested, we have a, a path forward in coming up with some hypothetical scenarios that we'll report back to the board um, in terms of the next steps as there hasn't been any indicated management action uh, at this point the board wants to take. The last question we were hoping to get some feedback from the board on, uh, I think to help the risk and uncertainty process uh, 
you know, moving forward is, is on how the information has been presented, the, the previous webinar survey, um, understanding the decision tool, you know, I think that would be helpful for us as staff as well. Thank you, Kirby. Um, you know, my feelings have been that the process moved rather smoothly and um, and it's it's been a learning experience, but love to hear from others. Anybody have any comments? I have no hands, Mr. Chair. Okay, Kirby. So if anybody uh, does want to provide any comment or, or any feedback to Kirby uh, relative to that question, um, suggest reach out directly to him or through me. That would be, be wonderful. Um, at this point, then we will move on to item number seven on the agenda. That's uh, developing guidance for law enforcement committee review of, comm of the commercial tagging program. And Kirby, I believe you've got a short presentation on this as well. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm just getting a uh, presentation up on the screen. Uh, so, uh, next slide. Uh, in August, the board was presented an initial report uh, from the TC, uh, feedback from industry members, and questions answered by the Law Enforcement Committee on the implementation of the tagging program. Uh, the focus of those questions going into the summer meeting was, was generally on how the tag program was working. Given the tagging program was implemented to address legal harvest and markets for Tatog, uh, there has been noted interest um, by uh, the chair, Bill Hyatt, to, to put together a bit more um, information of how compliance and impact is, is having on uh, the illegal harvest currently in terms of tags being applied to fish across the management unit. So next slide. So what was included in supplemental material for the board to consider ahead of today's meeting were just four questions that we're trying to get at more specific feedback from the law enforcement committee regarding compliance and um, impact on illegal harvest. The goal of today's uh, presentation is to highlight those questions for the board and try to get board feedback on whether they will fully address uh, the interest in, in further understanding um, the tag program's impact. If the board is able to come to agreement on those questions today, and we are able to convene the law enforcement committee in the coming months, we should be able to report back to the board at the winter meeting, uh, assuming that that all lines up. So I'll next go through these four questions for the board to consider, and then to wrap up, have you all provide feedback. Next slide. So the first is, are there any areas of concern, specific fisheries or markets where compliance with the TOG tagging requirements remain a significant issue? And this would be helpful, um, obviously, to better understand uh, if there are uh, other fisheries outside of the TOG fishery that um, is having an impact on it. Next slide. Second question is, is there a practical way for agencies to collect information on non-compliance with tagging requirements in the fishery or markets that could inform and improve the efficient, uh, efficiently and effectiveness of law enforcement efforts? So examples might include specific types of advanced information gathered by agency biologists or by partner organizations. Next slide. The third is any additional thoughts or recommendations for improving the efficiency and effectiveness of enforcement of the tagging program. Next slide. And the fourth and final question is, now that the tagging program has been underway for a couple of years, what is your expectation on if the program will ultimately be successful at reducing illegal fishing in markets? Next slide. So again, looking for feedback on these draft questions 
And if there's agreement that these questions address what the board's hoping to, to better understand on compliance with the tagging program and impact on illegal harvest, um, they could be forwarded on to the law enforcement committee to give feedback. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Bill. Thank you, Kirby. And uh, in a nutshell, what this is basically the, the uh, tagging program has been implemented um, and in the and compliance with it is important in order for us to achieve the objectives of that program. The law enforcement officers in the various states that are working on the ground, they've got the most hands-on, most detailed, most up-to-date information on where issues are occurring and, 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 and where concerns might be. And so this is just an attempt to reach out to those law enforcement officers and try to solicit some feedback on, on both where those where the where efforts should on, and and should be focused and uh, and any suggestions as to how the efficiency of that um, of law enforcement efforts could potentially be improved. That's the the whole purpose behind this short list of questions. So any feedback um, on what we're doing and thoughts on the questions, specific questions would be welcome. You have Dan McKiernan. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Bill. Um, I guess my concern is that some jurisdictions haven't even finished their first year with this program. But having said that, um, it's never too soon to get good feedback from the officers, as you've said. Um, the officers who are on the front line are definitely going to have insights for us that will be very valuable. Uh, I do have a question on the first of the four questions, if, if uh, Kirby could bring up um, that slide. It was a little vague to me what was being asked. Question number one. Is this supposed to uh, identify, say, supply chain, um, you know, situations where like a market may have some untagged to tag? I mean, what what is what is being asked of the officers uh, to to provide feedback on here? Hey, Dan. Yeah, this this is hopefully um, will to get at the most specific information that the officers have uh, um i think it should be accompanied by a suggestion or, or a request that they talk directly with the field staff as you say on the front lines and whether it's specific geographic areas whether it's specific type of markets whether it's um uh, specific parts of the of the of the chain the, the chain of custody you know mm -hmm. where the problems are occurring i think that's that's the intent here and if if you or others think that this question needs to be fleshed out a little better to to make to garner that information, then that's 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 the feedback that um, we're looking for here. And and I don't intend that I, I don't I think it would take us a long time to wordsmith everything and get it perfect here. But mm -hmm. I think uh, following the meeting, working with uh, with Kirby to make some changes to these questions might be uh, might be appropriate if 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 you know they come after further thought. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. I'll I'll uh, I'll yield. Next, you have Tom Fody. Tom. Yeah. One of the questions, uh, one of the concerns I've always had is when we put rules in place, is that states that are not required because they are basically markets. You know, when I go to like say Pennsylvania, I always check out the fish markets when going there. And I'm always concerned about when I see striped bass in the markets there, where they're coming from, because I know that there's transportation of illegal fish over the over the state lines. And if they're not required to use the tags in Pennsylvania, is that a loophole? Is that a problem? And I guess since Pennsylvania is not required to do tagging programs, how do we check on on the input to their markets like that? I'm just curious on that. So I, Bill, this is Kirby. I can I can jump ahead. in. Go ahead. Yeah. Kirby. Yeah. This question came up, um, you know, before the tagging program went into effect, which was 
for Pennsylvania because they don't have a, a fishery, but they do have markets, you know, how to ensure enforcement. And uh, Andy Shields, uh, who, as you know, Pennsylvania doesn't sit on the board, uh, did indicate that he, they were going to have their officers check to ensure that they had tags on fish in the marketplace. Now, I think to what Bill is, is trying to get at with these questions is, uh, this could be a follow-up, a set of follow-up questions to the LEC on on these concerns that uh, you're you're raising, Tom, of of whether that that is still the case that they are checking in that marketplace to ensure that the tags are being applied, even though the state is not on the management board and does not have a fishery. Yeah, because not only the markets, but also the restaurants, because that's where a lot of the, the talk wind up in. Thanks, Tom. And yeah, the, the hope is that, that law enforcement officers would be, would be well positioned to have the type of information that some of the type of information that you're talking about needing. Absolutely. Any other hands? I see no other hands raised. No other hands. Very good. So um, I'm going to interpret this discussion that, that, that people are comfortable with going forward to the law enforcement committee with a set of questions, that there might be some tweaks to those questions um uh, and that people will get uh, uh whatever uh, suggestions they might have to kirby and uh providing they're not um dramatically significant from from the from what's been presented here uh move forward accordingly uh very good so where, where are we on the agenda um that was the la next to last item the last item is other business, so I will ask, is there any other business to come before the board today? We have Dan McKiernan. Yes, Go ahead, um, Dan. thank you. Uh, Bill, earlier in the meeting, you'd mentioned this was your first and last board meeting. And so it appears to me that you have some kind of Midas touch. So I was wondering if uh, on the policy board, we could nominate you for Northern Shrimp or maybe Striped Bass. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, I don't even know what to say to that, <laughs> except no. <laughs> so, thanks. Um, but I, what I will add is here is is uh, before we go to adjourn, um, I'm going to say I want to thank K Kirby for an absolutely excellent job he's done the last two year two years supporting this board, and in particular keeping me on task. Um, over those two years, I got a lot of. Uh, quote, hey, Bill, just a reminder, unquote, emails. And uh, those emails and the discussions are greatly appreciated. Um, so thanks, Kirby. And if we were meeting in person, I think uh, the board would be giving you a nice round of applause right now. So with that, Tony, I'll just ask once more, is there any other, um, any, any other business to come before the board? And are there any hands? I don't see any other hands and I'm not aware of any other business. Okay, very good. So with that, we are ahead of schedule and we are adjourned. Thanks folks.